Excellent. Welcome to the Mass White Framework Sprint Demo Meeting. This would be focused on the community framework development that's been going on the last couple of weeks. Uh, some highlights to call out uh, related to exploit modules here. Uh, everybody likes remote code execution, I think. Uh, we, had, we had a number of things. Uh, the first one on the list is an older Adobe Flash Player uh, type confusion vulnerability that actually, I guess, got written up in 2016 and affects certain versions of the Adobe Flash Player and Mac OS that related to some browsers. Is that that's right. like a statement, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, we also have a new module uh, that can add a, a PowerShell download and execute payload to Microsoft uh, SLK, uh, symbolic link files. And that comes from community member Carter Brainerd. Once the file is opened by a victim on a vulnerable target, the PowerShell command is executed and it does what triggers the download of the payload and executes it. Uh, we also had a, a team member William Vu created a new framework module targeting a command injection vulnerability and the universal plug and play logic that's found in some Belkin Wemo devices. This vulnerability is actually patched by the vendor in 2015, but I think last year we went off and just bought a crock pot off of a large retailer online like anybody, any other consumer would, <laughs> uh, not naming names, but anyways, just brand new as, as any normal consumer would buy. Uh, and we found that even though this was patched in 2015, that this crock pot we bought ag ag contained the vulnerability in its firmware still. Mm -hmm. um, so shelf life. We also have uh, new modules targeting uh, the NUO central management system from community mem member Pedro. Uh, this, this is a particular system that's designed for managing NUO uh, NVRs, uh, network video recorders, and other devices. One of the modules uh, provides an arbitrary file upload to the target. The other one creates an SQL injection on the target. Both require authentication, but both will lead to remote code execution. So also to note with these new NUO modules, uh, Pedro also created a new mix-in that other users might find useful when creating additional modules that target new uh, CMS devices. So, love that value add. Uh, more highlights, so auxiliary and post modules. Uh, we mentioned the, the Falcon Wemo uh, a minute ago in the last, previous slide. We also have a new a Crockpot controller auxiliary module from Will uh, that doesn't, doesn't use the an exploit itself, rather it lets you control basic cooking operations via an implementation of a subset similar to what's provided by the Wemo app itself. Uh, we had a really uh, a Herculean effort uh, by community, community contributor Hoodie that added a new John the Ripper module uh, named ApplyPot that helps users crack smarter, not harder, using John the Ripper pot files. Uh, in addition to this uh, module, Hoodie did a lot of work fixing bugs, adding documentation, and modernizing the interface between Framework and, and John the Ripper. So thank you much, Hoodie. That was awesome. And I think we'll have a demo of this as well. Yeah, we'll yeah. definitely show the crack pots and everything else. All the crack pots. Mm -hmm. uh, refrain from making a joke about turning the camera on in the room. Uh, anyway, all right. So we've got also Hoodie also offered a new gather module for disclosing credentials of uh, vulnerable IP camera targets. Uh, some of the, the brands that they, they're affected are listed there. Uh, very cool. We had a new auxiliary module from community member SpinFu that targets vulnerable SAP management console instances. Uh, allowing the user to retrieve a list of config files with their full paths uh, located on the target system. And from community member LM Rosso, we have two new modules targeting uni Unitronics Vision Programmable Logic Controllers using the PCOM protocol. Uh, one of the modules allows uh, the users to send off unauthenticated start, stop, and reset commands. So that's something that you know, could be used as part of a denial of service. Uh, another, the other module allows unauthenticated read and write of operands on the target device. Um, and uh, B. Coles, uh, a very, very uh, solid, reliable community member, uh, gave us a, real, a nice little uh, Solaris PF exec module. It's an auxiliary module that allows a user to upgrade a shell to the root user uh, via the, the profile executor PF exec command in Solaris. Very cool. Uh, roll on to a few more auxiliary post modules that didn't all fit on one slide. Community member D. Garvick created a gather post module for pulling Windows PowerShell command line history uh, via PS read line. So you can see what, what people have been up to. Super, super neat. Uh, in addition to the two exploit modules I mentioned a minute ago that targeting NUO's uh, CMS, uh, Petrib also provided a module for brute forcing the session token of a currently logged in user. And he also provided a gather module that allows download of any file uh, from the target, including the config file, which can contain creds, uh, assuming that you've, you've authenticated with the device for that, that latter one. So that's cool stuff. 
uh, in the module world uh, as we move on to some improvements. Uh, we have been bumped. Ruby 261, Firefart got us to 26, Brent took us to 261. Any, anything you want to add to how wax poetic about 253 or anything? Or? <laughs> <laughs> oh, how I missed the, I, 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 I kind of wish we could go back to the old version of Bundler, but uh, other than that, uh, I guess so far the Ruby 26 stuff has been okay. Um, there's a little bit of Ruby on Rails oldness that's now suddenly showing up. Ruby 2.6 and Rails aren't super happy with each other, but mostly just warnings and, and failures. So, so far, so good. Right. We're about two weeks into it. We'll see how things keep spinning out. So. Very cool. Uh, we also had team, Jeff, uh, team member Jeffrey Martin added a new analyze command to the framework that can uh, suggest uh, possible exploit modules based on the known vulnerabilities of a target. Uh, I believe we'll have a, a demo of this uh, demo section. And community members Ishvendra and B. Coles added docs for a number of modules, uh, which helps everyone. So thank you all for that. Uh, MSF Venom received an update uh, from community member Patrick McGee to allow custom name section header when injecting a payload into a Windows executable. Uh, team member Adam Kamek added a new mechanism for better documentation via the help command. Uh, this, this effort was born out of a hackathon project that was also an award-winning hackathon project, I guess. We want to be completely clear about it. Uh, you can, the, the latest Metasploit wrap-up uh, on the blog, blog.rapid7.com website, uh, has more information about this, the new documentation functionality. You should check it out. We also had a number of bug fixes, uh, stability and otherwise, yay for those, uh, and more. Uh, again, the, the weekly Metasploit wrap-up blog posts that, that come out every Friday are, are a really good source for that kind of information, or you can go clone the GitHub repo or poke around on the PRs and kind of see what's been happening. And with that, it's time for demos. All right. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna start with here is I have uh, I have a Metasploitable 3 system over here is what we're gonna use one of our targets. I also have Metasploitable 2 that we're gonna look at um, in terms of how we can use this. Everybody's favorite uh, vulnerable targets to play with. Um, I also have, uh, I have a, a, a current console running up here and I have a, an MSFRPC daemon running and connected uh, down in the other window. The idea here is that this functionality was actually exposed both, uh, um, both as, a, as a new database command that is available when a database is available on the back end, as well as a command that's available when you do, uh, when you're looking at uh, a connection via the RPC. That was some feedback uh, that Brent gave, gave us when we were starting the work. Um, what I've got here, first, uh, simple, simplest, thing to do uh, is to look at the, um, the help command that was added in. Um, we start with that. We, if we take a look here. We now in the database commands, we have a new, new command called analyze. Analyzes the database information in, uh, about a specific address or address range. Um, up front, if you don't have anything in the database, we just report you we've got nothing there. Let's move on. Um, in, let's do, from if you have pulled information from uh, a vulnerability scanner of some sort, in this case, this is a scan that I did of a Metasploitable 3 system using uh, the Inside VM platform. You can import that data, and as it comes in, uh, we bring in all of the many multiple vulnerabilities and things that we find on this system. Once it finishes importing, we now see in our host table We have a new IP. That IP, if we actually look at the vulnerabilities on that asset on 445, we can see that this host is actually has the SMB remote, remote code execution vulnerability. This CVE here reference that's actually tied to it is actually tied to the eternal blue loop vulnerability. And if we ask the system to now analyze all hosts, we get back a report that this host is probably exploitable via the Eternal Blue module. We can go ahead and use that module. Set the R host to match the host. And in my case, because the network is a little picky about letting us reverse back to hosts, We should see this connect back in. Eternal Blue has actually been fairly reliable for me against the Metasploitable environment 
when I have the setup right. Yay, we did. Um, another way you can use this information is to do a similar call to the RPC daemon. Um, again, I'm in the default workspace and I'm asking it, uh, I'm gonna change this to ask it for the host that I'm looking for. Well, that was not right. Let's grab our IP address here. And so that gets us, this just shows the host. Let's do a call analyze host, we get back a list. It's a JSON object that reports we've got ex multiple exploits that we can actually run against this host. It's a way to be able to pull this information programmatically from remote service. Um, another option, we go out of that, um, is to do something is that this can be useful from, and the system is a little slow at the moment. Uh, we want to do a DBN map of a Metasploitable 2 system, which I have to go get the IP address for again because I forgot it. When that comes back, we actually get back a set of services. One of the things we know about Metasploitable 2 is that it's got a vulnerable backdoor in place. that will let us establish a session to a service that's running on it. Give it a moment. And we got a command session. Look at our sessions, but uh, the additional value that we get out of the analyze command from something like this is that that, module, that particular module actually reports uh, the vulnerability and the CVE associated with the vulnerability back onto the host into your database. So if we do a new analyze here and we look at our results, this is our original Metasploitable 3 instance with the Metasploitable 2 instance when we actually did the, the database information, the DB nmap to actually just look at the services and then connected to that system we get back a, res a piece of information that tells us that we can go back and actually reuse that exploit against that system. Um, so that was the, the, the functionality that's been added. Um, hopefully it's useful. Uh, it definitely looks very useful, Jeffrey. Thank you for the demo. Well, I like the RPC tie-in is nice too. That's pretty awesome. I, I like the fact that now we actually, Metasploit will store all the exploitable vulnerabilities that you've actually used against the host as well. Yeah, and, yeah. and now you have that record everything that is exploited. That's right. That's pretty cool. Awesome. Don't have to keep going. Uh, Brent, you want to? Oh, sure. Show yeah. some, some John the Ripper goodness. Now, this is one of the moments where I kind of wish um, for a few more words in the release notes section, because uh, these were some pretty amazing uh, pull requests that, that Hoodie pushed out um, this, this past a couple of weeks. I'll show it to you right now. So it all kind of started with some early um, uh, optimizations and modernizations of John the Ripper. In case you don't know, I'm gonna wait for my the screen to kind of um, update a little bit. Let's see if on network, you can do it. Excellent. So um, the, the, this is one of the early PRs um, for uh, fixing John the Ripper from, from Hoodie. Uh, the basic idea behind this is that um, within every operating system and a lot of different applications, there's a notion of a password hash. And password hashes are something that sort of evolve over time quite a bit. Um, and uh, as you know, crackers and techniques get better, uh, the hashes are theoretically supposed to also get better as well. So um, one of the things that we had that was kind of a, a little bit dated within Metasploit was our ability to, I'm gonna wait for the screen to catch up with my scrolling here, um, was the ability for Metasploit to actually understand modern password hashes. So over time, uh, different kinds of hashes have been added. Uh, here are a couple examples of uh, maybe bad password hashes that people wouldn't want to use within their systems like MD5, SHA-256, SHA-512, just some basic hashes being added. Um, in addition to that, let's wait for the screen to catch up again. All right, um, uh, th this pull request also added support, for instance, th for hashes like Blowfish, which is a, a modern uh, hashing algorithm that's adjustable strength and that sort of thing, which basically lets you slow down attackers and lets you 
make them take longer to actually crack a, crack a password. While this may not be super great from a John the Ripper point of view, it does mean that now Metasploit, just in general, now understands a lot more password hash formats than it did before. And you can see here how many more password hash formats were actually added as a result of, uh, of this pull request. And this is just the first pull request. There are actually several. Um, in addition to that, this is my favorite pull request, the John the Ripper modernizations again, again, again. And um, this is one of those cases where I wish I had about five or six pages to write release notes because not only did this sort of change the entire um, Metasploit password hashing infrastructure uh, within the library to understand a lot more different kinds of password hash formats, it also basically added about nine or eight or nine more years worth of um, technology into Metasploit's ability to, to crack hashes within John the Ripper. Um, so you can see here, like almost every module has been improved. They've all now have documentation. Um, you can see some notes here about five years ago, uh, particular cracker modules just weren't really working anymore because the hashes were obsolete or something like that. Um, so basically, if you now use a modern copy of John the Ripper, Metasploit is your Huckleberry um, and actually knows how to uh, properly crack a lot, new, a lot of new passwords. Um, and that's in addition to the apply pot, apply crack pot, I guess you might say, um, uh, ability where basically Metasploit can now read the effectively a password cache, password hash cache, um, <laughs> uh, and, and use that to recrack passwords that we've seen before. Um, so I'll give you kind of an example. So nothing up my sleeves. I'm uh, going to run the creds command. going to wait for the screen to update. Go on the screen. There we go. Wow, there's a lot of delay. I apologize. All right. <laughs> and uh, um, what we're going to do now is we're going to run a run a resource command. We're going to load some credentials into Metasploit. Resource. Um, let's see. Load creds. What we basically did here was we just loaded a bunch of credentials into Metasploit. Wait for the screen to update again. There we go. Um, so we, we loaded a bunch of credentials into Metasploit, all different kinds, Oracle 12, um, Solaris, uh, Linux, MySQL, Blowfish, everything under the sun. And we're going to go ahead and use another RC script. Um, I'll go ahead and show you um, that basically exercises every single one of these new modules and shows their, their functionality. So let's see, resource, use creds. There we go. And we've now cracked um, at least uh, almost two dozen different kinds of password hash formats, all within Metasploit, all kind of automatically. Um, I think for the sake of brevity, since we're running low on time, I'll save the use pot command for next time. But, um, but that gives you kind of an idea. Definitely check out this pull request. It's number 11351. It's basically a massive uh, rework of Metasploit's credential uh, mechanism that interacts with John the Ripper. Um, one caveat I should note to people is if you plan on using Metasploit moving forward with John the Ripper, you should use one also somewhat up to date because now that Metasploit is using all the new options. In fact, you can see there, I was actually missing one option on my Linux box uh, for, for the disabled logging output. Um, it's expecting a fairly up to date copy of John the Ripper. So um, if you got like a one from 2011, probably a good time to upgrade. <laughs> all right, good advice. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Very cool. Excellent.